So uh, today's talk, uh, today I'll, I'll present a perspective, a uh, beginner's guide to analyzing and visualizing mass cytometry or CyTOF data. And this uh, talk is really built on our publication in the Journal of Immunology last year, a, a paper uh, strongly driven by Abby Kimball, uh, an amazing uh, researcher in the group. Uh, and this paper was really triggered by our experiences of getting into CyTOF analysis. And we were incredibly comfortable with high dimensional flow, and I was surprised at the, at the gap uh, from trying to tra 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 transition from high dimensional flow to CyTOF. And so in this paper, we described our experiences, provided heavily annotated figures to really help people understand what the different algorithms are showing in terms of data visualization, and also tried to point out areas where you could be misled. Okay, so I've got, I have two goals for today's talk. First, where's the best place to start for your mass cytometry analysis? And second, how can you avoid mistakes when getting into this type of analysis? We'll discuss a range of topics from experimental design to parameters under, underlying uh, your high dimensional data analysis. So the first question to consider when you think about CyTOF data analysis is what's your focus? Are you focused on the flowers in this image or are you fo focus on the entire field and the landscape? Now, CyTOF has amazing breadth and depth for analysis. And many of us are interested in the possibility of identifying unanticipated discoveries, uh, such as this uh, chipmunk buried in the middle of this image. So there are two broad approaches towards analyzing your CyTOF data. Uh, the first is traditional Boolean gating using bioxial plots to identify anticipated cell populations of interest, which can provide broad immune phenotyping and it can be incredibly powerful in its own right. However, for those of us interested in making unanticipated discoveries, the use of high dimensional uh, analysis algorithms is really where we hope to extract new insights from these high dimensional data. One thing I'd like to emphasize here is that CyTOF data analysis is, is an iterative process. You might start with a focus question, but since CyTOF can afford the analysis of abundance, expression, cellular identity, and population hierarchy, the likelihood that a single pass analysis of your data is going to reveal the richness of these data is incredibly unlikely. And you're gonna have secondary and tertiary analysis at least. Okay. It's also essential to emphasize that your uh, CyTOF analysis is only as good as your experimental design. And this was uh, a discussion of uh, by many investigators yesterday. Without sufficient experimental design, good experimental design, and good sample quality, um, it's garbage in, garbage out. So you need to think carefully about your experimental design and identify ways to mitigate technical variation, whether this is barcoding, the use of uniform sample processing with SOPs, mitigating antibody variation. And of course, you need to sufficiently power your study, which sounds like a, something you should take for granted, but I can tell you that that is frequently not the case. So the number of safeguards that you need to implement to mitigate technical variation is influenced by the complexity of your study with longitudinal analyses and large cohorts requiring multiple protective mechanisms. Now, going beyond Boolean gating, there are a wide variety of, op of analysis options. On the left are uh, a whole variety of individual standalone algorithms, uh, but there also are programs that integrate multiple algorithms, as well as as well as fully automated analysis services, and we'll hear about some of those this afternoon. I'll focus primarily on the individual algorithms. Now, these algorithms often have a higher barrier to entry, but they also allow a unique opportunity to customize your data analysis. It's also worth noting that this is a rapidly moving field. There are many new algorithms that are being developed, often with very limited information support for people who, didn't, who aren't in that lab that developed that algorithm, right? And so this is a big challenge. Yesterday alone, there were at least 12 different algorithms for data analysis presented, and there have been additional ones today. I would also argue that there are evolving standards for the best practices in CyTOF data analysis. And so now we'll talk about where to start and what to consider when getting into high dimensional data analysis. So the first thing is data pre-processing and quality control. Once your data are collected on, uh, on CyTOF, of course, those samples need to be normalized to beads. 
you might need to debar code, you might need to correct for signal spillover, and ideally you can identify your nucleated viable events. Now quality control is essential for downstream robust CITOF data analysis. And there are many places in which there can be artifacts introduced. For example, if there is a clog in your sample collection line, uh, this can result in uh, highly aberrant events uh, surrounding that, that, clog event, that clog event. And so if you visualize event length versus time, and you see something very, a break in your collection and event, aberrant event length, this is a warning. Another example is the aberrant inclusion of equilibration beads, which can happen because a, a proportion of equilibration beads uh, can bind to intercalator. And you can be misled thinking that these are really interesting cells until lo and behold, no, they're just beads that were left accidentally in, in the analysis. So there are two fundamentals for current CITOF data visualization, and they are dimensionality reduction and clustering algorithms. And it's the integration of these two methods that affords uh, current CITOF data visualization. Please note, however, that algorithms differ in terms of their level of resolution. Some afford single cell resolution, others only afford cluster level resolution. It's also notable, not all algorithms allow you to look at individual samples, and instead they might only allow you to look at, at the aggregate sample. If you are using a clustering alg algorithm, I strongly recommend, if you have an interesting cluster, that you interrogate that cluster at the single cell level to ensure that there is, heterogen that there is homogeneity and that, there's not, and that you haven't accidentally discovered some hybrid cluster, which is basically a combination of two different cells. Okay. Now, one thing that I found very challenging at the onset of CITOF analysis was how the data are visualized. Okay. This is one data set analyzed with 10 different methods. In the top row, uh, and this is all colored by CD45 expression, in the top row are five methods that afford single cell resolution. In the bottom row are five methods that afford cluster level resolution. There is not a single right way to analyze these data, and multiple of these approaches can afford unique insights into your data. Now, if you look across the spectrum of uh, CITOF analysis algorithms, on the left, there are algorithms that allow a view of, of cells on a single cell continuum. And then, of course, there are a variety of clustering or stratifying algorithms. Please note, clustering algorithms are not equivalent. Some algorithms have defined metrics to identify the optimal clustering uh, number of clusters in your population. Others allow the user to say, I think that there are 200 nodes in my data. Okay? And so, uh, for, in that case, uh, the, user's, uh, the user's bias can profoundly influence the, the data visualization. So in our paper, we provided detailed commentary and notes on five of these algorithms, and since then, we've provided additional details on our lab website, and I'd encourage you to check that out. Okay, so we've also cross-compared uh, CITOF analysis algorithms. So in, here we compared five different algorithms across, the across different columns, and then analyzed uh, marker expression in different rows. So as I pointed out, there's not a single right way or wrong way to analyze uh, this data set. But if you think about interpreting uh, these different data visualizations, there are important considerations that you need to keep in mind. I would strongly encourage the use of clustering algorithms that allow single cell resolution. And while there are multiple solutions for that, we've found that frequently uh, the phenograph algorithm in CITOF kit has, has met many of our experimental needs that have been complemented by the strategic implementation of additional algorithms. So, uh, how do you choose which algorithm to use? Well, first you need to understand what the algorithm was designed to do. Once you do that, then algorithms vary a lot in terms of their usability, their performance, their data analysis and visualization. For new users, barrier to entry can profoundly influence which algorithms are being used. If there is a GUI, you are much more likely to be able to, to use that as a new, new user, okay? But even for expert CITOF users, I would argue that the stability and reproducibility and performance of some of these algorithms is something that we often don't discuss as much as we should and remains a, an ongoing challenge for the field. So your high dimensional data analysis can be influenced by multiple inputs, uh, ranging from your input population, input number of cells, the clustering parameters, and the algorithm settings. 
If you change any of these inputs, it will change how your data is visualized, how it's uh, your, your clustering results, and may influence your interpretation. But given that this is an iterative process, you are highly likely to go through multiple iterations of this. So here are a few examples of ways of ways in which your input can change your interpretation. So here we asked, using the phenograph clustering algorithm, how many CD4 T cell clusters are there comparing either on the top live intercalator event, intercalator positive events, on the bottom pre-gated CD4 T cells. And in the top case, five of the 29 clusters were identified as CD4 T cells. In the bottom case, there are now, six, phenograph says that there are 16 clusters of cells. Okay? And if you think about the level of resolution, you know, whether you're zoomed out and have a very high level view of your, of your immune landscape, or you are really focused on a specific cell type, will influence how you interpret the diversity of populations within your target cell of interest. Another example is that your input number of cells can profoundly influence your data visualization. And that's a well-known issue regarding TISNI analysis. Here, for example, we've compared 100,000 events on the top versus more than a million events on the bottom where you can see that when you have more than a million events, there is significant uh, blurring of different clusters, uh, really limiting your level of resolution. Now, it's worth noting there are algorithms that have been designed specifically to afford analysis of large data sets. For example, HSNE, uh, operated through Cytosplore, uh, affords unique opportunities to really analyze a large number of, of data points. Whatever algorithm you choose, I would strongly encourage that you understand how, what its performance is like. If you take the exact same data set, the exact same person, and you run it multiple times, what does the data visualization look like? Here's, here are two examples. Uh, so in the top case, we took one data set, ran it three times, and while the overall proportions of CD45 positive and negative cells is constant, the geometry of those different uh, cellular islands varies. In contrast, the algorithm on the bottom, three independent runs gave the exact same data visualization. Okay. And so I would say in, in the area of reproducibility, if you, are using, if you are analyzing data multiple times and you're getting different data visualization, this is a challenge for us to uh, then convey our results to the larger field. I would also challenge the field to increase transparency in your CITOF data analysis. Uh, I think if you're publishing CITOF data, you, need to, you absolutely need to include your input population, the parameters used for clustering, the algorithm settings. Uh, for at least some algorithms, such as CytofKit, you can publicly share the R data file, but I would strongly urge uh, sharing FCS files whenever, and clusters of interest whenever possible. The last challenge that I would identify is something, uh, uh, is, is that of identifying cell populations. So for those of us who are, are comfortable doing immunophenotyping, this may seem like a no-brainer. This is easy. Why are you talking about this? But there are many people who want to get into CITOF analysis who are not comfortable or not well-versed in the complexities of immunophenotyping. And so uh, this presents a significant uh, hurdle uh, to, to new users. And this is compounded by the fact that phenotypes are not always equivalent between mouse and human, that there's not even consensus among experts in the field in terms of the best criteria to define cell type X or cell type Y. And if you are fortunate and discover a new cell type, which it, that by definition is going to defy conventional, conventional classification. And so then what do you do? What do you call that? Well, I would encourage you to, to define cells based on protein expression or the combination of protein expression markers. And if you truly want to say that this is a hybrid B cell, T cell, you need to do complementary methods to, uh, to make that conclusion. So taking a step back, in terms of the broad perspective, mass cytometry uh, data analysis, robust mass cytometry data analysis, really requires strong experimental design. There are now a, a wealth of analysis algorithms. That's not the, from my perspective, that's not the challenge. The challenge is how, how does the larger community make use of, of this wealth of, of algorithms? There's wide variation in data processing and visualization. There's often limited support and information by the developer. And statistical analyses are frequently underdeveloped with the exceptions of uh, statistical al algorithms such as Citrus, DIFSIT, and Cell CNN. Now, I will say, multiple algorithms will allow you to make similar conclusions, but nonetheless, uh, it's a dizzying number of algorithms programmed in diff different languages, and navigating this can be extremely uh, challenging. So 
There are multiple ways that you can analyze these data, but please note that this is an iterative process um, where you can query abundance, uh, expression, population hierarchies. And then finally, I'd suggest three major goals for the field. One, I'd suggest increased transparency in, in reporting your, your algorithm settings and your methods. Two, I'd recommend reducing the barrier to entry for algorithms. If you're gonna do that though, it's really important to have safeguards. So if you, uh, uh, to prevent people from misinterpreting your, your data. For example, if you're trying to run Citrus on, a sample, on N of three samples, it is significantly underpowered. If you're gonna use Citrus, there's a metric that actually tells you the model error rate and how, how effective that model is. Often, that's not something that's immediately obvious and is easily overlooked. Okay, so there are multiple resources for getting into Cytoff analysis. I'd recommend that you check out our paper as well as our website for a variety of, sort of resources, including video, t video tutorials. I'd also uh, point to the Stanford website the, uh, for data scientists and bench scientists, uh, the cytoff.biosurf.org, which is incredibly useful. And Cytoff Forum is a wonderful resource for the community. Finally, uh, we found that Cytoff Kit is a fairly low barrier to entry, um, but there certainly are additional algorithms that can be useful for data analysis. Thank you so much.